I always try to take it right to the edge, you know. Yeah. And look, you know, the woke stuff is making it kind of interesting. I wonder how long it'll be until I get cancelled, if I get cancelled. I've been making little movies since I was about 14, you know. So then, yeah, I sort of fluked a job at the ABC as a cleaner and worked my way up. So somebody had to die for me to have this career, sadly. You know, and I didn't kill him. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Well, Detective. Oh, Mr. Detective, I had nothing to do with it. It was natural causes. Natural causes, <laughs> don't give me that bull. Paulie Fennec, welcome to I Catch Killers. Well, I haven't killed anybody except with, uh, you know, I've made some killer jokes over the years, so I don't know if I'm on the right show, but thanks for having me, Gary. Paul, it feels like an interview room, so let's not uh, get carried away. We'll see. Do you want me to caution you up front? You're not obliged to say anything unless you wish to do so. Oh, look, I know, I know my rights, bro. Don't worry. So <laughs> I won't be saying anything I don't wish to be be saying publicly. Okay. All right. Now that we've set the uh, set the standard, hey, it seemed like a lifetime ago when uh, your show Pizza first uh, first came out and hit the TV screens. Um, I hadn't seen anything like it, and I, I've got it. I was laughing. I, I found it funny, but I wasn't sure whether I should be la- laughing. What? Uh, How did you get the thoughts to do a show like that? Well, look, this is, uh, well creatively, I guess. I, I used to always uh, go to the Bass Hill Drive-in, and if, you, yeah. if you're around the country, it was, was a drive-in in New South Wales, and I was just I used to drive past this pizza shop, and there was only ever two people in there, and they were always watching TV, and it looked like the least busiest, worst pizza shop in the country. It always stuck in my mind, and. Anyway, years later, I was working at SBS, and they wanted a comedy uh, to sort of complement South Park because yeah. they hadn't had a success with comedy like South Park before. They bought it, and as a fluke, it was rating <clears throat> like crazy. And um, I don't know. I just had the, I've always had this idea about a comedy about an ethnic pizza shop, you know. Yeah. Um, and not sort of. I mean, in no disrespect to Acropolis now, but I felt that was very kind of uh, tuned one particular way. I wanted to sort of show all the different ethnic faces of Australia, whether that's yeah. a, or maybe just the different faces, whether it's Bogan, whether it's, you know, Italian, whatever, you know, Asian, because that's, yeah. that's the Australia that I saw. And uh, so I just wanted to do a comedy that looked like Australia, you know, let's say. So you really, you've drawn on your own own experiences, but uh, you have shared the uh, focus around, like uh, the, your Wogs Out of Work, I think you were referring to, focusing on one uh, ethnic group. You're basically giving everyone a spray. Yeah, look, I, I just felt it was the Australian humour that I grew up with, you know, yeah. and also then I was, you know, got different sort of flavours of ethnicity in my family and different sensibilities and sense of humours. But uh, the Aussie sense of humour that I sort of grew up with was give it to everyone fairly, but, uh, you know, the, the, I think the, the Australian sense of humour is give to everyone but don't be cruel, you know. Yeah. And then that's uh, that's what I think Australian humour is anyway. Well, OK, this is where we, we flip, the, uh, flip the interview. What's your portrayal of cops? <laughs> do, you, well, do you honestly think we're all lazy, incompetent buffoons? Look, mate, just go back to the three stooges. Come on, Charlie Chaplin. Everyone wants to give it to coppers because they got the power and we don't. So, you know, when you're the comedian writing the thing, you want to have the power and you use it, you know? Oh, Jesus. You, 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 uh, 34 years I was in the cops, Paul, and I was offended every time I saw your show <laughs> about how you portrayed the cops. But... To make matters worse, my name's Gary Jubelin. Your cop's name was Gaza. Oh, well, there you go. That's 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 true. Well, look, it wasn't based on you, just in case uh, you want to Good. I, I, I worry, we're worried about that. You know, look, we uh, we dealt in stereotypes, and obviously, uh, you know, if anyone got offended, just don't get offended. It wasn't, you know, it was all in fun, and we give to everyone. And uh, But look, there is a, a long tradition in, like, screen comedy of, it goes back to the Keystone Cops, you know, yeah. cops being portrayed as, you know, stooges. Yeah, and uh, you know your bumbling kind of funny characters get away with stuff. You know that's just it's, so. But don't shoot the messenger, mate. That's it's well, the comedy uh, tradition. Yeah. It could be argued that's a documentary. <laughs> it's uh, when you're talking about police. Look, most of police, most police, I'll say, have got sense of humour, and I know at the time when the, the show was out and uh, talking around the uh, mill room, we having having a bit of laugh how uh, how cops were portrayed, and and you grab some good characteristics. Probably to probably to the extreme, but you tapped into some things. Well, look, you know, uh, I think all the characters displayed, you know, good and bad of their stereotypes. You know, and I like I like big characters. So uh, you know, uh, and the guy the guy that played. Well, we've had a whole bunch of different people. My favourite two cops were probably uh, Murray, who was the the bald cop mm. for years, and then uh, in, in Houses, and uh, it was it was Gary, who, played by Gary Who. Yeah. Um, but they. Definitely reminded me of different cops I'd met over the years. You know, like Murray was the sort of the 
the seething kind of angry kind of you know frustrated kind of uh, you know general duty's cop and then yeah. gary was the kind of sort of over it the seen it seen it all kind of detective kind of mentality you know yeah. so i don't know what do you think about that was that was it no, was no, there something uh, in and that and that's that's the thing uh paul you you captured it well like the the essence of it like just the subtleties of the uh, the behavior the cops i love the conversations the cops driving around in the patrol car yeah you, know, uh, you could you could make a show out of that if you just put a <laughs> microphone in a, a cop car the stupid comments cuz you're filling in a day and you're basically in uh stuck in a car with someone for a, a 10 hour shift and you're just going from one disaster or one funny thing to another and there's some interesting conversations yeah you know, look i think it must be uh, an interesting point of view on life i mean i obviously haven't ever lived that sort of side of it you know but yeah. uh, you know you go from you know lots of tragic stuff you know so i guess that's not funny but i guess what i have found with people who do deal with tragic situations whether they're soldiers or cops or whoever yeah. is humor is a good place to go around all that because otherwise you drive yourself crazy yeah and i i think that's uh, the fact that you've identified that and i i think if people look at the shows and the huge body of work the stuff that you've done you got to find humor in some tragedy you got to find humor in uh, some serious stuff and i i spent a, well you know as i've said 34 years in the cops and people often ask how, how did you cape you know 25 years doing homicide but we would have a you call it black sense of humour, just sort of laughing at things, some of the comments that were made at crime scenes. If people heard it in isolation, they'd say that's, you know, it's wrong, it's disrespectful. But in the context of the thing, we're feeling the emotion, but that was the way of, we're dealing with the emotion. And I think there's a lot said for uh, dealing with uh, trauma that way. I think it's just uh, humans have done that forever. You know, yep. I mean, if you look at, you know, any, any kind of comedy that goes back to the Greeks, you know, it's always comedy and tragedy sit side by side. So I think humans just have a way of, you know, uh, if they, uh, I don't know, detaching and making light of a bad situation because what else can you do? Yeah, you know? well, you've got, you got to be able to laugh at yourself. And even um, uh, families, victims of homicide, like there is no humour in that. But I, sometimes they've said some things to me and I've sort of looked at them shocked and say, this is the way we've got to deal with it. We've got to, we've got to see some humour in it. We've got to see the irony in it. In it. Now, on the uh, weekend, I watched um, How's Those Versus Authority again. <laughs> and I was doing it as a research for the, uh, for the podcast and uh, watching a few of your other things. And I made some notes whilst watching it and uh, from a viewpoint of today's woke society. And by my calculation, you've possibly offended eight different ethnic types, four yep. organisations and a couple of Aussie icons. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting because we, we always, I, look, I always try to take it right to the edge, you know, yeah. and look, you know, the woke stuff is making it kind of interesting. I wonder how long it'll be until I get cancelled, if I get cancelled. But then again, you know, there's there's guys around the world who are still pushing it as well, like Ricky Gervais and Dave Chappelle still stay right on the edge. Yeah. So I think if you're known for being kind of you know a bit of a rude prick yeah. in your comedy uh but people know it's in fun and it's not mean spirited you know they give you a free pass these days i think if you've got a history of it whereas i think if you just came out of the blue and said some you know if you were a young comedian and you just started sure. up then you probably would be like cancelled you know before you got out of the door you know yeah that that might be perhaps you you've gained some uh, credibility or you know some credit points along the way because that's what you've been doing for a long time but I speak to uh, some comedians and, uh, yeah, they push the envelope on, on certain topics. And uh, one of them, and I, I won't mention mention his name, but, uh, you know, he really pushed on, on one issue and then uh, one of his shows people complained about something that he said. And he made the point, and I understand where he's coming from, they come to my show because they know I'm going to try and shock them with stuff that clearly I don't believe, but I'm going to say it just for the, the part of the entertainment. And then these people take it seriously. Have you have you encountered that with the, your uh, your work? Oh, not really. I mean, there'd be sort of. I'd have to say, after all the things we've done, and we've done a lot. You know, we've been doing stage shows for twenty years, and the movies and the TV shows. I think I'm up to about something like one hundred and fifty half hours of TV or more. Yeah. Okay? And um, the percentage of complaints would be at around. You know, if it was one percent, you know, that would be a lot. I think we've had almost no complaints really, which okay. is surprising. Uh, but I think one of the reasons is, you know, you asked about the stereotypes and the, or the different groups. I actually hire real people from, you know, that ethnic group to play that ethnic group. Yeah. And they bring a lot of their real kind of community into the humour, you know. And that's why I think people have always given us the thumbs up rather than the thumbs down because 
that ethnic group goes, hold on, it's that's someone that I can really that I know, you know, yeah. like uh, whatever it is, whether they're Asian or you know Middle Eastern or you name it, because um, I don't believe in sort of hiring people to you know like a like Chris Lee's got a whole different kind of tactic where he plays all the different plays uh, different characters, but, yeah, you know, and it, it ultimately it burned him, and I always felt that 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 wasn't cool because you know we've got a whole nation full of Islanders and everything else that he could have cast, you know, with his genius, yeah, but um, you know, I I think you know like. And Al Jolson was doing blackface in, in the, the 20s in America and it was phased out in the 60s. And, I mean, Australia was still doing it, you know, like in the 90s and the 2000s. You go, well, come on, you know. I hadn't realised it had, uh, had, had changed. Well, it's just, it was, I don't know, it's a funny country and it's a funny culture and it's changing all the time, like in the last 30 years. Like if you want to make comedy, you've really got to kind of soak up what's happening, you know. Yeah. And uh, we've really changed as a culture incredibly in my lifetime. I mean, you probably saw it too. You know, we were very British and then ah. suddenly now we're kind of very American, I think. Uh, well, uh, yeah, uh, growing up in the suburb and you mentioned the, the Pizza Hut, you had a Chinese restaurant and the Pizza Hut and that was about <laughs> the uh, the extent of uh, your cuisine from uh, overseas and you thought you were so, um, yeah, exotic going to a Chinese restaurant ordering the uh, the sizzling prawns or, or whatever, right. and it was, yeah. And it's a better society today, isn't it? Look, I don't know. There's, there's things that I, I, I kind of like. The, I went to – I visited New Zealand, at, New Zealand about maybe seven years ago, and it yeah. reminded me of Australia in, in the 70s. Right. In the sense that there was a lot more uh, – the manners, polite, people were a bit more chilled out. Um, I guess because I live in you know, Sydney and I hang around in big cities, you get all that kind of crazy – you know, the, the cities are a bit, the energy. A, a bit tense and a bit uh, high strung. I, th- I think the diff- I think the thing that I don't like about now is that the uh, the economic pressures on people are making them a bit kind of uh, I don't know what's the word. They're a bit burdened. And yeah. I don't I don't remember people being so burdened when I was growing up. You know, I think the, that was one great thing about Australia in the seventies and the eighties was people were a bit uh, there was permanent work. It was yeah. less stress, I think, let's just say, you know, like people were having days off and it was cool. You know what I mean? Like you could have a sickie, a sickie was a given, you know, <laughs> yeah. like, but now it's really like an American society where it's like money, money, money. And uh, if you don't have money, you, you struggle. That's what, uh, that's what drives us. Now, before you got into your comedy, you, you did some uh, serious stuff. And just in the, the research, you, I, I think one of the first shows that you uh, directed, More Than Legends. Yep. which was a documentary highlighting Aboriginal culture through the eyes of elders. And uh, yep. t- talk to us about that because I, I'm genuinely interested in that because I, through my work in the cops, I've, I've spent a lot of time with Aboriginal communities and uh, the the respect that's given to elders and the, the teachings that those elders can pass on. But what what was your uh, your show about and what uh, motivated you to do a documentary about that? Oh, look, you know, when I was, at, I was at the ABC for a long time and at the ABC you got to work on all different kind of programs. You yep. know, you'd work at kids. They, they, as a director, they would, you know, move you around different departments. And uh, when I was kind of essentially, you know, there was in a section that you could do documentaries, um, I mean, I thought something that needed to be highlighted. I mean, I, I don't, one thing I don't like in the media is, and it's just, it's about truth in any kind of background, let's say, uh, but particularly with Aboriginal people, they tend to be portrayed as like positively as sportsmen or artists or negatively as criminals or whatever, you yeah. know, but there's not, uh, and, and knowing uh, that they have one of the oldest cultures in the world, um, you know, all Indigenous cultures have all this great wisdom and I thought, you know, like it would be great to get some real elders captured and recorded just for posterity and also maybe you learn some wisdom and uh, we met some incredible guys and it was it was really more about because uh, you know when they talk about the dream time and legends it, it makes it sound like some sort of fairy tale yeah. but um, you know these stories are actually you know, a lot of the times they're the morality stories they're you know they're religious stories they're spiritual stories there's they're not just some sort of they put that word dream time it makes it sound very kind of I don't know it it, 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 it it takes the the value of I think the wisdom away a little bit. It's a, yeah. it's a bad interpretation, you know. Okay. Uh, so anyway, it was just it was about uh, three different elders in three different places telling different stories, and um, you know we got some kids to animate the stories as well. You know, some Aboriginal kids, Indigenous kids, 
And uh, so I thought it was really good. Yeah. You know? And that passing that, giving the kids a uh, understanding of the culture, the language, if it, it also uh, helping them with the uh, the language, I think it's an important part to understand your heritage. Oh, look, uh, you know, I think probably Australians don't realise, I mean, I'm, I think one of the things that underpins my comedy and my life is I'm all about fairness. I, I don't like yeah. things that aren't fair. I don't like injustice. And if you would say that Aboriginal people have been treated fairly in Australia, you'd have to be a, a you know, straight-out liar because they have yeah. not been treated fairly. And, um, you know, I think uh, that's one thing that really burns me about uh, our media, our culture here, is that uh, Indigenous people, don't they don't get a fair go. They really don't. You know, I mean, you can say... You, pump up this or pump up that or throw some money at this, but just by and large. Mm. And like all, the, I've travelled a lot around the world and Indigenous people are generally the most beautiful, genuine people. They laugh the most easily, the kindest, the the, the first people who will engage with you and, and be very loving to you. It's just how they are. It's, just, it's a natural way with them, I would say. Yeah. And, um, you know... I don't know what's happened in this country and, and lots of other countries, but they just want to kick Indigenous people. Well, I don't think we understand. People look at where we are now. And, and what I learned uh, working in Indigenous communities and the time that I've spent with Indigenous communities is that, uh, you know, there's some of the trauma, or not some of it, a lot of the trauma is passed on from generation to generation. We talk the stolen generation and people go, that was a long time ago, it, it doesn't happen now. But hold it. That's a family that's been broken down, and they've they've lost that uh, that connection between their you know their their elders, and it's something that's very sad. And I I love the work just round here, like we're recording here at uh, Erskineville, at Redfern. There's a, a group a tribal warrior Shane Phillips run, runs a group. We've uh, get some uh, young kids along, kids from the area, young Indigenous kids, and puts them through a boxing session in the uh, in the mornings. And uh, I've attended some, and uh, so impressive what they're doing, just bringing the community together but then also teaching them that at the end of the session they get in a circle and some of the young kids you know you're young you don't want to be talking in public gets them into the center of the circle and uh, talks about what they learned today and a little bit about their culture and, and different things and i think that gives them a real sense of sense of pride and belonging oh, that, look, uh, I, I think i'd say that you know um all indigenous people around the world are proud of where they come from and, and you know what what's been before them you know yeah I think the big um, gap between Western culture and Indigenous cultures everywhere is that, uh, not just here, but particularly here, is that we didn't... Well, Western uh, society is all about build and grab and, you know, uh, move on and... and just, you know, but a lot of the things that people are rediscovering now being kind of like, uh, you know, what would you say... Um, in harmony with the environment, uh, you know, the way of settling things with families, uh, real justice versus overly kind of legislated justice. They had ever, they had all this, yeah. you know, and, and, you know, arrogantly Western societies came in, you know, all over the world and said, you know what, we got a better way, you know, and just try and bulldoze a whole kind of spirituality and knowledge into nothing. But, you know, you, you can't, you know, uh, I think... You can't do a bad thing and it doesn't get it – does, it doesn't live – that bad thing will live on. So I think yeah. there's a lot of justice coming to Indigenous people. It, it, it warms my heart what you're saying there on a number of uh, levels. When we talk about – yeah, the whole thing is about uh, climate change and everything else, living in harmony with uh, society. Our Indigenous cultures were looked at as, prim as a primitive culture because they lived in harmony with nature. And now you look back and we go, oh, look what we've done to uh, you know, the climate. And then we've got uh, our Indigenous people that were ridiculed because they didn't make changes to the, the environment. They lived within the environment. There so many things like that that uh, we could learn from it. Justice is another, another thing. You know, we put people in jails. In Indigenous communities, they had to live with these people. So it wasn't about just... Throw them, throw them away, and then come back. They had to work out ways of punishing them, but still make them a value mem member of the community. So yeah, there is a lot, lot to be learnt, and uh, people don't really understand that. I, I find it funny. I, um, I've been into uh, meditation and yoga and you know, Eastern philosophy, and then I've sat down with some elders, Aboriginal elders, and they're basically teaching me the same thing that I go overseas to learn because I think that's yeah, you know, what could I learn here and the message that they're putting across is very similar to what I learn when I go overseas. There's there's universal ancient wisdoms that uh, stupidly Western culture ignored. I mean, uh, one of the things you, on that documentary uh, that I did learn was one of the... And we didn't discuss it in the documentary, but um, it was the first 
I think he was the first Indigenous detective in Western Australia yep. and he'd first train drive and he'd obviously a very clever guy, you know, and he, but he had been initiated as a sort of a spirit man or medicine man, whatever you want to define yep. it as. Um, and he did tell me that, you know, they had cures for everything, you know, like uh, all, all the modern ailments there were cures for, but because the uh, kids, at least in his tribal area, yep. you know, that they weren't going through the law, as he described it, the levels, I guess, of yep. learning that you would need to do, all that was being lost. And you can see, like, in the Amazon, they're pulling out, you know, the, the indigenous people there are the ones saying, that plant will do this and that plant will yeah. do that. And, and that's all the medicines so that we much, have. So much to be learnt yeah, from it's, it. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, indigenous people... It's it's even in the Bible. The Bible says something like, "Well, everything you need, you can eat." It's a plant, essentially. Yeah. If we're talking about medicines and plants, like the Bible says it, you know. So it's just ancient wisdom that uh, we've chosen to ignore at our own loss, you know. Yeah, I, well, I like your take on it, Paulie. I really do. I, I think that uh, there needs to be more discussion like that, and people sort of opening their minds to it, other than uh, just sort of looking at it, going, "Yeah, this is a Western way. This is the way we do it." Um, your heritage. Maltese father. Yes. And your mum, um, indigenous? Oh, crazy mix on my mum's side, but part yep. of that, yes. That's okay. right. You know, so, uh, but Irish, German and, you know, indigenous blood. So, you know. so that combination is what's, uh, what's created you. How, how was your childhood growing up? Yeah, no, it was good. Look, I was pretty much, I was a bit of a, I mean, look, I was probably, my dad kind of, uh, I was close to my dad's side of the family, I think, because yep. um, my mum's side was, there weren't that many left. A lot of them died in World War Two, really. Yeah. Um, and uh, but I mean, I had a great kind of you know childhood, childhood. But then when I became a teenager, I was I was just running around. I pretty much wasn't at home. It was just a, sort of that era where you didn't you know the seventies and the eighties where you didn't need to be at home like they are now. So I was just always out, you know. Yeah. So I didn't really deal with my parents. I don't think for about seven yeah, you, years. You, you know? You're right. You just disappeared, didn't you? you? You disappeared and came back on Sunday night. And I was I was a bit like that. So. Uh, Oh, look, you know, up until my teen years was great. I, I got kicked out of a few schools because I got, I got bullied at the first sort of high school that I went to. And uh, I was just a little, I was, you know, small and stupid. Yeah. And, you know, I wasn't a very street wise kind of kid. I was just a typical happy kid, you know. And then uh, that school had uh, a Lebanese group, an Italian group and the rest. And I was in the rest. Yep. And the rest was the weakest group. And I was the most vocal out of the weakest group. So. I, I, I... Look, maybe I'm judging you, but I would imagine you had a bit of a mouth on you. If uh... yeah, I've always been a bit of a smart ass. I just I can admit it, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know. Um, so it was around yeah. the, the Stanmore era that you grew up. Uh, look, you know, it was sort of I, I mixed it around Stanmore, Marrickville, Leichhardt. Okay. Uh, you know, that was the main sort of areas, really. Because I've had a lot of people, and I know a lot of people that grew up around that area, and there was a fine line between uh, which path you went down. And I've had a, some people in here that have done a lot of time, and they grew up in that area. Other people that uh, have uh, gone in different directions. Uh, oh, that was look, they were it was the rough kind of area. Working back class. There. Yeah. yeah, you know, I mean, it was the lower end of working class. You know. Uh, like Newtown, like now, it's sort of all you know. It's it's everything friendly, you know. But uh, back then, it was rough, you know. Like if you wanted to get beaten up, Newtown was the place to come, yeah. you know. Like it was full of a lot of you know. You just just walking around any night, there was always some crazy person who wanted a fight, you know. Yeah. And I mean, that's the other thing too. Australia, that that's one thing that's uh, interests me about Australian culture is there was a real brawling culture until recently really yeah. you know like uh, it started the, as far it probably goes back to the convicts but what I know of it from the 60s and the 70s and the 80s were in the 60s people you just turn your glass upside down and it meant you would have yeah. a punch up and then if you lost you're expected to buy a drink and there was no hard feelings I mean I, I've been told that I don't know how that would work practically but I've had a lot of um, older guys tell me about that era and it was it was like and I grew up with all that sort of brawling too you know a lot of fist fights and all that but now yeah. if you if you even just Speak loudly, you're toxically masculine. So it's it's a real it's the culture's changing completely. Yeah, you know? it gets confusing when you've seen you've you've seen that uh, that time you've grown up in that time where you know, you got to defend yourself if someone says something. Well, you know if you come to blows and you shake hands afterwards. But yeah, the world has changed in that regards. Yeah, I mean I remember I, as I was in my teens and like early early tw maybe not my twenties but maybe mainly the teens. You know the nightclub era. You yep. know, when we went out, like there was plenty of fights, but you didn't fight someone to, I mean, obviously there's always people who would go too far, but by and large, if you had a fight with someone and somebody got knocked down, it was all over. You know, there was no stomping on their heads or. And the weapons. Uh, yeah. yeah the, the, it was more of a fist fight. And, um... you know, it, it just wasn't, uh, but you know, now 
I don't know. Everything seems to be more extreme in general. And maybe it's just an older guy's take on it. Like uh, I suppose maybe the old guys yeah. of the seventies would say the same thing, but I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I don't know, but I, I get a sense that the streets are more dangerous. That if you get in, get into a fire, that's not going to be someone's going to get knocked down, and then uh, that that's the end of it. It uh, seems to go a little bit further these days. Yeah, no, especially look, I I do comedy all around the country, and I I like doing the kind of yeah. places that other comedians won't go. You know, so they're more like, poorer areas, and you know, uh, houses, let's say, yeah. you know, and um, there, there there is a lot of uh, like that that Esche culture is really, I mean, they're just all these kind of these kids have got this whole kind of thing going on, but they're really stabby. I don't know what it is in their culture, but they are not scared to stab people yeah. in, in that world. And I don't know where that came from and what that's all about, but it seems to be a thing, you know, like... Uh, it most definitely, it, it seems to be a, a cultural thing that within that that uh, those type of groups that it's all right to carry a knife. And, uh, you know, being a homicide detective as long as I have been... It's amazing the damage that can be caused by by a knife. Yeah, just one one stab and you hit the wrong spot in the body and uh, you've you've killed the person. There goes your life and their life. It's uh... look. I remember growing up. You know, people did have you know butterfly knives and things, but I think they were more. I think people had them more for show. Honestly, like I don't think that anyone who was carrying a knife would would really want to stab someone. You know, yeah. but I think there's a different headspace now. I mean, like, I don't. I could be wrong. You know, I'm just at a distance looking at it. You yeah. Know? But um, I know there's one thing, you know, working on the show Houses, I ended up like, you know, I mean, grew up with a lot of kind of people down the chains on the social kind of ladder, but uh, I met sort of real long-term Houses and, uh, you know, multi-generational kind of Houses people. And, um, you know, there was just a totally different kind of headspace than I'd understood before or cultural kind of thing. There's all different nuances in there, but... Um, some of them have been brutalised in so many different ways, which is why they are where they are. Yeah. Um, they, they're a bit savage when they're provoked, you know, and uh, it's just a, I don't know, it's one sad thing I'm seeing as, as Australia, as elements of Australia get poorer, they're getting nastier, you yeah. know. And I, I think we uh, underestimate the impact that uh, your childhood can have on you as, as you grow up. And I, I've had people sitting opposite here that, uh, yeah, have been in trouble for some very serious crimes. And then you look back at their uh, their upbringing and uh, I think, well, shit, if I went down that path, uh, I'd probably be doing the same sort of stuff that you did. So Well, you know, I, I got the legacy of, you know, after all the sort of, I mean, I don't want to cry. I'm not crying about the, I got bullied and, you know, it made me sort of, I had two choices, you know, like be a victim or fight back. So then yep. I started fighting back, you know, but now I've got that sort of, I've still, that trigger is still in you. If people want to provoke you, you're prepared to fight back, yeah. you know, yeah. is that good or bad? In today's society, it's probably bad, you know, probably, in, you know, society's a hundred years ago was probably a good thing to, you know, have a bit of a uh, warrior factor if you needed well, to. Well, it was valued back then. But uh, these days, you know, it's, it's you know, it's the, the worst thing you could do is sort of, um, you know, lose your shit and... <laughs> You, you know, uh, if somebody kind of push you and you you beat them up later and walk around like a champion and start praising yourself. Mate. You'd be you know you'd, you'd be gone. You go to jail for one, and you know if you're in the media at the end of your career, and that's it. You know? Well, yeah, you do something wrong now before you you lick your wounds and maybe apologise or uh, someone will pull you aside. Now you'll be a YouTube sensation if you do something uh, something stupid. It's a, it's a, I don't know. I, don't, I mean, I guess I'm just just I'm just talking for myself. I don't really like. I think it's it's too far. It's common sense is gone. I mean, look, justice is good. Yep. And I didn't like, uh, you know, elements when I grew up in the sort of the 80s and that where there was racism and prejudice and, you know, you'd cop it, you know. But uh, there was common sense back then, but prejudice now there's just like no common sense and there's no – well, prejudices aren't allowed, but they're under the surface. There's no one's – sort of vocalising them publicly, you know? I, and I think that can be worse. It's that uh, those biases, those unconscious biases that people don't talk about, that uh, but they sit with them because it, it's not discussed. Um, but did you experience racism growing up? Oh, mate, I've had everything. I've had sexism, heightism, ageism, <laughs> you name it. Every, every ism there is, I've copped it over the years, you know? Uh, and and let's let's speak out for the uh, the bald guys too. Oh, look, you know, I got over, I got over the baldness years ago. That doesn't bother me. But uh, yeah, no, mate, I've, I feel like I've had every kind of prejudice that could be thrown at you. It doesn't bother me. You know, I've sort of actually, in a way, um, I think all the challenges in my life yeah. uh, have made me really strong internally, and uh, it gives me the discipline to do all the things that I do. And I have a, I guess you know, to maintain the sort of things that are, the shows that I do, you've got to have a, a good level of discipline, you know. Yeah. And then from that and the success that you get with that, then you have these other great things in your life. So, but I wouldn't have had the strength to do it if I hadn't had all those 
people telling me no, no. You know, professionally, I was knocked back a, a long time for all sorts of reasons, you know. Yeah, and, like, people might uh, look at you as a overnight success. with, the, And you've had a lot of success, and we'll, we'll talk about some some of your achievements. And, uh, you know, full credit to you. You've, you've made a success in a very tough, uh, tough industry. But you started working at the uh, ABC. And yeah, well, I, I think I, I first started making – like, I love movies. See, when I was um, – I guess when I was in that sort of teenage zone where I wasn't very happy, uh, the one place that made me happy was movies. I'd go to the movies on my own and watch just the cinema. I used to walk from Stanmore to the town hall yeah. and, you know, I'd watch a movie and, you know, it, it, it's it's a cliche, but you do, you, you, your troubles leave you, you know, when you're immersed in the in the movie, you know. So I always loved cinema and I always wanted to be in it. I thought when I was a little kid, I thought, I want to be an actor, you know, like everyone wants to be an actor. And So then growing up in Australia in the 70s and seeing everyone was blonde and, you know, like, just didn't look anything like me. I gave up on that, and I thought, oh, well, maybe I could do something else. So I started making uh, little movies. I sort of actually aspired to be a director more than yep. an actor. And um, I'd been making little movies since I was about 14, you know. So then, yeah, I sort of fluked a job at the ABC as a cleaner and worked my way up every... So literally you started started as a cleaner. Yeah, there. cleaning the stage. You started in sta- as a stagehand, yeah. which is cleaning the stages, you know. And then um, if you're good, they sort of push you sideways into props and um, building sets and things like that. And so I did all of that and, you know, just sort of literally worked my way up over a few years, you know, had a knack for it, obviously. You know? Yeah. And did you look at things a little, were you looking at things from a, a creative or artistic side of things? Were you you trying to learn as you were working your way through that? Yeah, look, I think I just, I, I don't know, I, I don't think I'm very smart. You know, I think I just absorbed things yeah. rather than, I didn't sit there sort of, you know, going, you know, like, wow, I'm going to, to dissect this and you know how could I do it better it's just, I think I just learned I'm, I'm more of a practical learner you know I sort okay. of saw everything and how they did things and I sometimes I'd say to myself well that, that was really silly like I'd work on um, the old uh, things like Mother and Son at the ABC which yeah. is a kind of uh, if you don't know how that's made it's like there's a studio audience and there's a kind of it's very scripted and you know it's very structured in that the actor has to stop on this mark and say this line and and they rehearse it, rehearse it. They, that, that was with Gary McDonald, wasn't it? Mo- yeah. Mother and son. Yeah. And a couple of other ones. And um, they just, in my in my mind, they, they rehearsed it so much by the time they just ran the cameras because they, they record it live. Uh, they don't edit it. It just sort of runs like a theatre show. Yeah. That all the fun was gone, you know. And that's one thing I, I always took away from that was that when it comes to comedy, some the best comedy is spontaneous, I think, you know. Yeah. And, uh so when I'm shooting the stuff that I shoot, I always allow the actors who are, have the ability to ad lib. I give them a lot of room, and, and you know, you structure some people in the structure, but the others you let, know, let them just yeah, cause flow other, naturally. Because otherwise, you know, like it's stale. You know, if you say just say a sentence fifteen times over, and by the fifteenth time, you won't, you don't even know what you're saying when, anymore. When you deliver that punchline that you've already practiced and all that, it does. It's hard to make it come across genuine. It's funny, you know, some lines can work after being repeated a million times, depending on the actor or the yeah. performer. But uh, generally I find, I mean, look, I use a lot of non-actors so uh, and a range of different performers, you know, from actor to kind of like guy off the street and, you know, because they might look funny or sound funny. And uh, I guess maybe it was the experience with documentary and I did a lot of sort of what they used to call it, uh, it wasn't reality, they used to call it factual at the ABC, we used to do factual TV, that's how old I am. And, um, yeah, you know, the sponta- the sponta- working with different people and trying to find the gold... Like I don't know, you interview people, so you probably know the same thing. Yeah. Sometimes you've probably planned all this whole thing, and then but the best is when it comes out naturally. Yeah, well, you, it... you'll say something, I'll react to it. That's and, right. Uh, yeah, we flow from there. Even in a even in a uh, interview room, homicide investigation, part of the uh, yeah, because I was doing it so long, I was also training people on in- investigative techniques, and I, I said, you can do all the prep work, but what I saw sometimes people do the prep. And they've got the questions, they ask the questions, but they're not listening to the answers. And the real good interviewers, the ones that I rate and the ones that I tried to learn from, would be listening to what you're saying and then jump on it right at the right time. Yeah. Hold it, you said this, just take you back, bang. Well, that's that's a sort of, I don't know, I, I guess it's a, a an unwritten mantra in my work is, is reactive comedy. Like the you react to, the actor reacts to this or we react, react to the place or, you know, sometimes it's so... Because we're really low budget, so we're really like a small crew and we just sort of end up in all these weird real places. I don't use studios because I can't afford them, you know. Yeah. And sometimes you've planned this whole thing to your left, but then there's gold to your right. Now, unless you're experienced enough to know 
go off the map and chase the gold, you'll just have this stale thing that you chased because you, you were supposed to, you know? Yeah. yeah. So it's just, we're, talk, we're saying I'm just giving you a long version of the same. This but, is the same thing, you know? But, but it is interesting, and it's interesting that you uh, you recognise that because I think a lot of mistakes are made where people try to structure it too much and it becomes, it sounds fake. And if anything about your shows, there's this, um, you know, authenticity to it. And uh, probably you've explained it in part that you, you're using, you know, genuine characters in there. You're grabbing someone from the Housing Commission to play an extra or one of the people is a, is a house out. So, oh, well, I think you mentioned. Um, I think uh, the houses. We were talking about the houses virus. Yeah, thing, yeah. Um, and there's a, all the riot scenes in that were actually just all real people who just were. Because you know, there's a lot of people say, oh, "I want to be on the show, Paulie." You know, so I said, "All right, just put a thing on Facebook. Who wants to come down and do a fake riot?" And you know, about fifty showed up, and it was, it was it's kind of fun having people who've never done uh, any acting or performing. And, yeah. You know, trying to get them to to do a scene like that. You know, oh, it would be fun for them too. I, yeah. I would imagine you enjoy a lot of what you do. Hey, the one of the um, early starts you got was in uh, Tropfest. Oh yeah, um, Tropfest. So <laughs> you you got that, and I, I like the 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 winning part where where you won it. That was nineteen eighty eight. Was man. it? Yeah, something like that. Well, look, uh, you got you got runner up in eighty five or third place in eighty five. Well. So the Tropfest thing kind of went like this. I was working at the ABC and there was another director who was a good mate of mine and, yep. and Tropfest was kind of becoming trendy. It used to be in, uh, was it Victoria Street? I don't know. Anyway. For those that don't know, it's a short film festival. Yeah. And, uh, just explain a little bit well, so people... Okay, so it was a, a short film festival that grew out of uh, a bunch of films being played at a cafe called the Tropicana, uh, which is in King's Cross. And there was a lot of col- colourful people at this, uh, you know, this cafe. It was actually... I don't know if he's, I he's, is he still, is he gone? Or maybe I shouldn't give his background, but it was a very, very dodgy background to how he got his money. He was an Italian guy. That's all I'm going to say. And um, One of Sydney's well-known, uh, yeah, racing identities or something. No, it wasn't yeah. like that. It may be back in Italy, but yeah. not in Australia. He kept his head down here. But anyway, uh, so we had this cafe and it was, you know, lawyer, it was one of those classic lawyers go there, pros, all sorts of colourful yeah. characters and um, all the filmmakers and wannabe filmmakers were there and, they, you know, they, they, they created this... Film festival was just really small, but it grew in about within about four years. It went from being like just a local thing to kind of, uh, you know, Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman turning up to support it. You know, and uh, I, the first year I, I put one in, and it was about pizzas. It was a, it was that idea I had to do a comedy about pizzas. You know, and I put myself in it, and if you watch it, it's very similar to the rest of the shows. There's fights, and it's a bit sexy, and the formula hasn't really changed. You yeah. Know? And um, anyway, I think I came, I got the audience prize, but I didn't get the first, second or third. I got the audience prize, yeah. or popular, whatever that was. And then there was another year I went in and I didn't win, didn't win anything. But then the year that you're talking about was the big year where they, and it actually was massive because they moved it from this little street in King's Cross to Rush Cutters Bay Park. They had Samuel Jackson as one of the judges. All the Star Wars people were there. It was now huge, you know. And um, I don't know, do you want to ask me a question or you want to tell, tell uh, what Well, it, it, I'll, I'll lead in the fact that uh, you did it with Ostentatious, was it? Yes. The, the, and so that was the film. Tell us about the film and then I'll let you in on the secret that you won, but there was another side story to it. Yeah, so, okay, <clears throat> me and Ostentatious had a bit of... We'd been working together on a few different things and at the time I was I was fond of him and uh, I promised him that I would make a, um, a Tropfest film for him. He had an idea. Uh, but the, the, the trick was I'd actually won a different competition... Um, called uh, the Met Fest. It was a, it was the Telegraph or something. Not the Telegraph. The Sydney Morning Herald had its own f- yeah. film festival, and I put a thing in and I won that one. And the prize, amongst other things, was you got to go straight into Trop Fest, but not for competition. And I was playing in it, so I'm in. I was already in Trop Fest, you know. Yeah. So then, okay, we make this thing for uh, Ostentatious, which was the concept was he was playing like two roles. Uh, um, Nazi war criminal cab driver and, a, and an Israeli Mossad guy who's caught him out in Australia and there's this conversation between the two of them. It was funny, you know, but it was literally like we shot it in about three hours and cut it very quickly and it was really, really tiny, you know, and I thought, oh, it's got no chance, you know, and I, I, I thought we can't put it in under my own name because I'm already in it, you know. Okay. And I promised I'd make it for him. So I thought, oh, look, who, who would make this movie about this, you know, Jewish war criminal, like a real Jewish thing, you know, which is, and there's no disrespect to Jewish people, but I don't really have much connection to any of that, you know, at all, really. Um, so I thought, okay, it's, we'll just give it a, a name that sounds Jewish uh, as the as the director. Uh, Laura Feinstein sounds good, you know. Just yep. So I, I honoured my promise, put it in, and then wouldn't you know, it got bloody selected and... Uh, you know, um, what a night, you know, like I have to, so anyway, so I, the first crazy thing is like John Paulson who was running the, uh, 
you know, the competition was calling. We had a dodgy number to call just in case. And I, and I had this really bad message. Like I was going, hello, it's Laura here. It was that bad. Like it was, <laughs> yeah. I just put a piece of paper over my mouth and put on a high voice. And he was living, he was saying, oh, Laura, we love this film. We want you to come down to the, they were having drinks and, I'd leave a message back and, oh, I'm in, I'm in Los Angeles, I can't come. And, you know, so anyway, I just ducked it and weaved. I thought, oh, my God, this thing's been selected. Uh, you know, it's just kind of embarrassing now, you know, and yeah. I just bullshitted them and now it's been selected, you know. <laughs> you and never then, thought um, it'd get that far. Uh, yeah, it, I didn't. I mean, anyway, and then comes the night. And when I was there that night, like, uh, I actually had my ex-wife was with me and she was pregnant with my second son and my first son was an infant and my dad was there. So, you know, like... Whole proud, family's proud moment. Well, I was still on on edge because I got to see my film because the other film was there. But then, you know, I'm thinking, I'm just going, oh, I can't win. There's no way I can win. I have to, I have to deal with this because I was. They were showing all the other films. They've spent millions on some of them. They were huge. Some of these other short films. I was going, thank God, there's no chance this is going to win. Anyway, first it wins the prize, best actor for ostentatious, and he yeah. didn't show up. And he sort of just said, because he's gutless, he said, oh, you you just accept the for me. So I had to go up and run up and say, oh, thanks on behalf of ostentatious. And go back and then they do some other prizes and then they go and now the winning you know the this the big prize now the best film of chop fest and, and keep in mind samuel jackson's on stage giving away samuel jackson yeah. the, the, you know he's a big, the, mo big the motherfucker guy he's the, one of the biggest guys i've seen in my life all the cast of star wars are down there some of the best directors on the planet are all sitting in the crowd and they go the winner is intolerance from and i have to get up and you know i jog up go fuck you know and then everyone's a bit like because John Paulson's pumping out. He's going, it's the first time a woman has won the prize. Yeah, he's really yeah, whipping. Yeah. He's going, it's great that a female's won it. And I'm jogging up there, you know. And, and then I get on the stage and Samuel Jackson's over here looking down. I mean, like, they, everyone's looking confused and <laughs> rush cutters Bay Park, like 40,000 people. And I just have to say, ah, excuse me, there is no Laura Feinstein. It was me. <laughs> and then everyone kind of goes silent for a bit. And then they... Kind of save it, and there's some handshakes, and I get the prize, and then I get the back, and then John Paulson, he's, he's spewing, he, he wanted to punch on with me, and my dad was there, and my dad's going, don't fight, Paul. And anyway, it's sort of bittersweet, and it was in the news the next day, like it was, uh, it was, it, but then the infamy actually sort of somehow worked for me, you know. I think yeah. it's the Australian sense of humour, kind of everyone kind of liked the fact that it was. I mean, it wasn't intentionally trying to say fuck you political correctness yeah. but a lot of people interpret it that way well uh, when, when i heard about it and just rereading reading up on it it, it cracked me up it could only just where something so sweet goes so bad so quickly it's uh look, ultimately it was good but at the time you know like you get your pregnant wife there and the the, the, the you know the festival kind of guy wants to punch on with you though know? <laughs> you know, like, I, I, only I, this shit can happen to me you know? I, I think the funny part is that you never thought it'd get to that point no. and then oh shit oh shit oh fuck i've won look Cynically, you could say that, you know, uh, they they just wanted a woman to win, you know. Yeah. I don't know what their motives were, but it was just sort of, I don't know. It, it was just funny how things turned out. Did you know? ever go back in uh, Tropfest? I didn't. Uh, they actually created a, new, a clause after that year, a Paul Fennick clause, so you had to prove your identity. <laughs> <laughs> It wasn't quite a QR code back then, but you had to prove your identity so they couldn't get uh, stooged again by uh, people like me. Say so you're a game changer in the film industry. Well, in that case, I did change the game. That's <laughs> fair, you know. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, we talk about the uh, pizza TV show, and that was uh, around 2000. So this was after your uh, your success and tragedy of the Tropfest or embarrassment of the, uh, the Tropfest. All three, all three. <laughs> all, all at the same time. Those that uh, people that don't know uh, the pizza show, I'm just going to some of the, the way it's been described. And I'll just read that out, then we'll, we'll talk to it. Pizza is a half-hour comedy about a bunch of deranged pizza delivery guys in Western Sydney, is and at the time it's the highest-rating local program on SBS. This is what you get if you watch pizza: ethnic stereotypes, sexist tit jokes, and gratuitous violence are the meat of this show. The cast includes two Lebanese hoods wearing tracksuits emblazoned with images of Uzi machine guns, a bon bong smoking Aussie stoner called Davo, a wheelchair bound, I'm not even going to say that word, I've just I'll put a line through that, and a mob of uh, Ephanasian refos. Fennec plays himself, Paulie Falzoni, a fast-talking Choco Hoon who drives a canary yellow 1970 Valiant and is regularly forced by circumstances to beat up an assortment of dwarves, 
blind people, homosexuals and cops. Is that an accurate description? I wouldn't of the... say there was that many homosexuals got beaten up, to be fair. It was like maybe just one in all of a that was like, The rest of it is fair. The rest, <laughs> fair, but not the, the homosexuals. That's not fair because I think we only beat up a gay sperm in the movie or a guy dressed as a sperm. Yeah, so, b- beat up a sperm. Yeah, well, he was yeah. dressed as a sperm. All right, right. fair. Uh, <laughs> but uh, there, was a, there wasn't a lot of gay bashing, to be fair. To, to be fair, the rest of it, totally fair. I, I, okay, so that's a fair take on it. So I'm going to ask you a few questions questions here. How did you come up with all those ideas? Well, you know, I think what it was is I, I grew up in this sort of, like, I love comedy my whole life, and I think I just wanted to sort of do versions of a lot of the comedy that I liked. You yeah. Know? Like, I sort of loved people like in the 80s, Eddie Murphy and uh, John Belushi, yep. uh, Monty Python, you know, all those kind of standards that were out there back then. Um, but I think... Uh, I guess I must have been influenced as a kid by crazy English comedies like uh, On the Buses and Are You Being Served, which were all big stereotypes. Yeah, and when you think On the Buses, like the, they had the uh, the black fella there and uh, there was just so many, you look at it with Pied Today's standards and racist comments that were made. And... Well, I, I trip out because when I look at Are You Being Served, which was a comedy in a, a Grace Brothers, a shopping centre in England, uh, yeah. and it had like the working class guy the old horny lady, the, the the campy gay guy, the the stuck up kind of boss, you know, like yeah. it was a, it was full of stereotypes, you know, but it was it was really it's still pretty funny, you know. So I think it must have just sucked stuck in my brain or something, you know. Those Carry On movies, you know, as well, yeah. same same kind of thing. Um, I don't know, and Monty Python as well. Um, I don't know. I, I I don't honestly don't know where the comedy ghost comes from. It sort of just channeled me in some. I, I think I read a lot. Uh, about what's happening just generally in pop culture, and I think it just was just like it reinterpreting terminated. funny thing. Oh, but at the same time, I would always find funny real situations and then rewrite them yeah. into the show. I, I can't think of an example now, but uh, you know, um, there's always crazy things you read about. You know, uh, but then funnily enough, over the years, we and like you know, they say whatever life imitates art or whatever. You know, like we when we did houses. Um, there was a scene in Houses where I had this car. Where I played Frankie Falzoni, who's this hood, you know, this kind of dodgy kind of. It's not a drug deal, just a crim, you know. Yeah. And he steals his car and he graffitis it all over it. He graffitis cop hunter on the bonnet, and then he, he sees these two cops in front of him, and and he just decides to launch into them to to ram them. But he, you know, it's just a comedy thing. Yeah. But it ends up flying over the top of the cop car and hitting a, a kind of a big wall behind it, and then he comes out with a drunk a bottle of uh, alcohol, going fuck. I missed. That's what happens. That's what I say. Don't drive when you're drunk, you know. Yeah. But anyway, the point of this story is that years later, some guy in Queensland painted Cop Hunter on a car and graffitied it and then had to go at the cops too. So, you know, I went from taking things out of the newspaper to creating them somehow. That's, that's yeah. bizarre. Anyway, so I went off the topic of pizza. But but yeah. I, I like the observation and uh, the comedians that all creative uh, comedians that I, I've met and spoken to over the years, they look at life and we, we see there's something funny there but you grab it and you retain it and then, then put it out there. When you pitch that show to SBS and SBS was, you know, they were the woke station before even woke world came into things. Like, yeah, how, a, how did you you pitch it? Like, uh, it was well, it was a funny. Well, it's not a funny story, but it's it's an interesting story. So, I've, I had the idea because the I did a few different short films with the pizza theme because obviously my first one that one chop fest mm. that looked like it was funny and people liked it and um, you know uh, John Polson who ran it described me as Australia's Martin Scorsese, which was a great compliment. Yep. So I was all sort of a bit pumped up and um, anyway. Uh, is it after the uh, even after the uh, yeah. top first incident? Yeah, I think I don't think the notoriety somehow sort of helped yeah. it. But I had this boss um, who used to run. I think he was the head of television back there then. And ironically, his name was David White. You know, which is kind of a funny yeah. name. And he was about as white as you could get. Really, a very nice man, but just considering he was the head of SBS, it was, there wasn't a lot of what you saw. No, and, and SBS was a really strange place back then. It was like a, f- a bunch of feudal ethnic kingdoms. There were all these different people in charge of all these different areas, yeah. and none of them really agreed on anything. None. Them, it was weird. Like you, you know, each little area was like its own little feudal kingdom. You know. Yep. Anyway, so I came up with the idea for pizza, and I said, "These are the short films I've written a script, and you know, can we do it?" So he goes, "Okay, do a pilot." You know. Anyway, a year went by, nothing happened. You know, and he, he, we said, oh, you know, what's happening, you know? He goes, do another pilot. So we did another pilot. Anyway, we're still waiting. And then, tragically, the poor bloke suddenly had a heart attack and died. And yeah. his replacement was a guy I used to work with at the ABC. And he greenlit the show within a week. Okay. So, so somebody had to die for me to have this career, sadly. <laughs> 
you know, and I didn't kill him. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Well, Detective, oh, Mr. Detective, I had nothing to do with it. It was natural causes. <laughs> natural causes, don't give me that bullshit. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering whether I should caution you. There's, um, on a personal level, with that putting that show out, like, uh, did you get some pushback or did anyone go, what the hell are you doing? Yeah, look, a lot of people didn't like it. It was, uh, look, but I think the the, the uh, resistance to it, a lot of it was racism. Like, for example, you know, just yep. sort of the Lebanese. There was a lot of uh, just, I don't know, there, there was a lot of, and I think there still is a bit of racism in the country. You know, it's getting better. Yeah. I think kids are much more uh, open-minded now than uh, older generations. <clears throat> I mean, we just grew I mean, I have prejudice in certain things. We yep. all grew up with different prejudices if you grew up in the 70s and the 80s. There's, yeah. there's nothing you could do, you know. But um, I think uh, I remember... There was a, a lesbian producer who worked at SBS and she always accused the show of being misogynistic yep. because we had Annalise Brackensick in there playing a, you know, a ditzy kind of model character. Yeah. Right? So I used to argue with her. I said, look, the, the characters love women. They're like desperate guys in a pizza shop, you know, who have no women. Yep. They don't hate women. They love women, you know, like they're desperate to be with women, you know. So, you know, the perspective is when they see a hot chick, they, you know, they lose their mind. Like most sort of young guys, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, so I mean, we're talking the pre-internet phone days. So, you know, if you saw something sexy, like now you can get anything you want at any particular time on your phone or at home or whatever. You know, yeah. but when you didn't have those options and you saw something that you were, you thought was attractive, you, it was a bit of an over-the-top reaction. I kind of felt, at least with the guys that I knew. Yeah, no, I uh, put my hand up to that. You remember, remember those the, days? Yeah. So, uh, I don't know. There, there, look, and there was, I think we got. Um, I remember one review that said it was the worst acted show on television. To be fair, we were all pretty green, you know, but where's that reviewer now? Yeah. yeah <laughs> and there's been a lot of success to it too. Um, we're going to go back, we're going to delve into your shows because you've got so, uh, such a big body of work, but there's another thing that uh, just that cracked me up. Um, you're also an author and uh, perhaps a uh, religious leader um, for a book called The Bogan Bible. Oh, the Bogan Bible, yes. Well, well, you know, I think after doing um, all the live comedy around the country, yeah. uh, I found that the one joke that people seem to laugh at the most uh, were Bogan jokes. I didn't, I didn't really know why. I mean, I wasn't really sort of necessarily close. To, well, I just didn't – it emerged. It was like, you know, in the 70s it was yobbos, I guess. Yeah. But Bogans were a whole new thing that seemed to sort of kick off in the 90s or the 80s or something, maybe the 90s. And just everyone would laugh at a bogan joke. I guess I, I didn't really understand it, but um, so we did a ton of different media that was relative to that. You know, like Houses was probably the first yeah. thing that really touched on parts of that world. And then uh, we did a show called Bogan Hunters, where we looked for the greatest bogan in Australia, which ironically ended up coming from Tasmania, Tasmania, which <laughs> probably makes sense. Not, not ironic, actually. It makes sense. And then yeah, so then uh, they wanted to do a book about essentially a spin off of that, and it was the Bogan Bible. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I just there's a couple of things I want to talk about the uh, Bogan Bible. So it, it's uh, this is a blurb about the book. In the Bogan Bible, Paulie Fennec, the world's foremost Boganologist, salutes these authentic, outrageous, fun-loving, free-thinking Australians, unraveling the histories and the mysteries of the Bogan world and icons such as the thong, the mullet, and the burnout. And then uh, it, uh, you've got some uh, chapters here in the book, and the chapters start. Bogan Landmarks, Bogan Town Planning, the VB Xmas Tree, <laughs> um, Thongs, and the Great Bogan Adventures and heaps more. Sounds like a, a fascinating book. Well, look, you know, I don't, it's not going to win a Nobel Peace Prize, but it, it, I think what it does show is the fun that's in the – there are people who do, like, identify as Bogans. Like, it's not like a label, like, you know, for, for some. It's like, they go, yep, I'm fucking 100% Bogan. Mate. Have we all got a little bit of – and I, I'm just – as you're talking about it, I'm, I'm thinking about it. Why? And I understand we all laugh when you mention Bogans. No one takes a, a, a offence. Is it because we've all got a little bit of Bogan in us? Well, I think I think most Aussies who, uh, you know, um, let's say, have a, a bit of that old school Aussie humour, certainly do. You know, yeah. like I think uh, if you, there's just a lot of it's. I think it's a sort of how do I say it's. It's I guess maybe it's an extreme expression of Australian culture. Maybe that's what Bogan will yeah, is, could be. is. You know, cars. People who are into cars. You know. Um, sort of partying, kind of, uh, you know, just being wild, anti-authority. <clears throat> you know, these are sort of real Australian cultural kind of aspects, you know. But, 
you know, some people live it to the full, and that's 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 the real bogan, you know. Like, yeah. I, the one thing I love about uh, all the bogans that I've met and, uh, is that they're the most, some most honest people that you like. You can ask them a question, and they will not give you a guarded. You know, no, no pretense about them. No, I probably would if you're a cop. I mean, maybe you would get a straight answer, but just in a regular space without charges pending, you get a uh, you know they just they'll tell you anything about their lives. You know, I mean, I do live comedy shows now, and part of the show is I go out in the audience and I talk to couples and singles and I ask yeah. them the most intimate questions you could imagine, and I get the most honest answers that you would not believe. You know, yeah. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I could just imagine some of the answers uh, I, I, you would get. I'm just trying to think. It's, some of the crazy. I mean, we had this one. I, mean, I don't know why this one comes to my into my mind, but it's a true story. So, I just asked this guy. I said, "What's?" Sometimes I say, "What was your last relationship?" And you know, who I say, "Who fucked off? Who did you fuck?" Her? And yeah. then he goes, "Oh, she fucked me off." And I go, "What happened?" She says, "Oh, well, we only had sex once, and then she got pregnant, and then it turned out she was a witch. And uh, what she'd actually done was she wanted to have a kid because she wanted to reincarnate her dead dog into the kid. So once the kid was born, she named the kid." The name of the dead dog, and then she ran off and left the bloke. Now you know <laughs> you, you can't you can't invent that, can you? So but, but that's a pretty intimate admission, yeah. you know, like uh, just saying. So yeah, and that's to me an example of one of the the, the best. Well, look, I, I love bogan people; they're really generous, and you know, I find, the sad thing for me is that that culture is getting poorer and poorer with this the way the country's treating. Uh, just generally all its citizens, but they, they seem to be doing it the toughest. And yeah. um, they're the people that donate. They're the people that turn up for charity bike rides. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, whereas, you know, middle class and people with money, generally I find it a lot less compassionate, you know, and, and, and fun, you know. Yeah, it, you, when the way you talk and the, the way you talk throughout, and we, we laugh at things, but you, you seem to have a real sense of social justice. I, I do, and I don't know whether it came from my parents or... I just don't like things that aren't fair. Maybe because I copped a lot of unfair situa- yeah. situations in my life. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't like seeing with anyone. And, uh, you know, I really, I, I mean, I love Australia, but I don't like where it's going. You know, like uh, just sort of culturally and just over legislated. You know, lack of freedom. You know, like uh, sort of. You know, just the, well yeah. that that nanny state type feel, yeah. isn't it? You can't do this, you can't do that, and uh, you go the. Uh, we'll we'll talk about we'll talk about that in. Uh, you, you, get, you get a fine for sticking your elbow out the window in New South Wales. Yeah. Come on, yeah. you know, that, that that shouldn't be a law. That's that's not law. That's a justice. I know. don't make the laws, sir. I'm just here to enforce them. Yeah, well, I've heard okay. that a few times. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's my comeback <laughs> to uh, stupid uh, stupid laws. Let's uh, let's take a break, Paulie. When we get back, I, I want to talk to you about uh, something you're renowned for, and I think you are the uh, yeah the foremost uh, expert on thonging. Yes. And uh, it's uh, yeah, it's a rarely talked about martial art, but uh, you seem to be bringing it out in the fore. Mate, I've been doing it for a while now. If there was an Olympic uh, category for thong throwing or thong hitting, I would be the gold medal champion year after year, no doubt. But uh, let's talk about thongs when we're back. And uh, some of your shows and the characters that have inspired the shows because uh, I think there'll be some fascinating stories there. And I want to put you on notice for a question. And uh, you're an observer of society and uh, you pretty much give everyone a spray. You certainly uh, attacked us as the cops. Now that I'm a podcaster, am I safe? Because there's a lot of podcasters out in this world. What's your take on podcasters? You don't have to answer now. We'll do that on, on okay, part two. I'll, I'll think part, about what I think about podcasters. Part two, because there's not many people you meet that aren't podcasters these days. So, well, it's, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk. We'll talk after the break. I might have a bourbon in between. We'll see what happens. Okay. Cheers, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> 